Hello and welcome back everybody, I'm Jason, and today we're tackling a question that might seem simple on the surface, but like many what I like to call simple questions, actually have quite a bit of depth to it. And the question today I'm talking about is, why are the oceans salty? Now, if you've been to the beach, you've probably tasted that distinctive briny flavor of the seawater, whether it's intentional or it's an accident while you're swimming, right? But why exactly are our vast oceans of our planet that cover most of our planet salty while the rivers and the streams on the land in general don't really have any salt or very little salt? So grab your snorkels and prepare to submerge yourself in the science of salinity. Okay, now let's start with the basics. The saltiness of the ocean, or what we call its salinity, is due to dissolved ions in the water. But where do these ions actually come from? The answer, like many things in nature, is actually more complicated than it seems. It's actually a combination of processes that have been occurring for billions of years. So the primary source of the ocean salt is actually the land. I know it sounds kind of weird to say that the salt comes from the land, but that's actually true. The continents that we live on are kind of constantly seasoning the oceans, sort of like a giant salt shaker. Now here's how it works from a big picture point of view. When rain falls on the land, it's slightly acidic due to the interaction with the carbon dioxide that's up in the atmosphere as the rain falls through the atmosphere. And it forms what we call a weak carbonic acid. So by the time that the rain reaches the ground, it's slightly acidic rain, and that weathers the rocks, breaking them down chemically. The resulting ions, which come after the breaking down occurs, then flows and is carried by the rivers and streams into the ocean. Let's have a little bit of an aside here. Remember, what is an acid anyway? So you have acid in your stomach, that's hydrochloric acid. There's a hydrogen, that's the hydro, the chloric is the chlorine. It's two ions that come together and make an acid, right? Usually dissolved in water, in some kind of aqueous solution of water. But notice the hydrogen there, right? Here we're talking about carbonic acid, when the water falls through the carbon dioxide and makes another kind of acid we call carbonic acid. The formula for that is H2CO3. But again, notice those hydrogens. There are other kinds of acids, H2, SO4, and so on. So hydrogen is the common theme. In general, an acid is a substance that when it is dissolved in water, it donates or is liberates hydrogen ions. Now, if you think back to the periodic table, hydrogen is the simplest element that there is. It's one proton in the center and one electron uh, orbiting. Now, of course, it doesn't orbit like a planet orbits, but you can get the idea from the mental image there, right? It's away from the nucleus there. All right, so the hydrogen atom is the simplest thing. And when we say it donates a hydrogen ion, what we're saying is the electron's gone from the equation, the proton is what is really donated. So what we say is an acid is a proton donor. Now, if you have a solution full of literally naked protons, proton donor is what an acid is, in solution, those protons have a positive charge and they are going to attract any electron that they come into contact with. Right, and that means even if it has to steal it or grab it from the outer shell, that's why you put, in general, metals in acid. They react violently because a lot of metals have electrons far away from the nucleus that are hanging out, barely held on in the outside shells there. And that naked proton, that hydrogen ion, can grab one of them and the reaction then starts. So in general, acids are proton donors or hydrogen ion donors. And the reason they react with stuff so much, like break down rocks and such, is because these naked protons can just grab electrons and suck them in with electrostatic attraction very, very powerfully. They're gonna react with almost anything if the concentration of acid is high enough. So the rain coming down, breaking down the rocks is one way that ions, or salt, so to speak, get into the oceans, but that's not the only source. It turns out that hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor also contribute significantly to the ocean's saltiness or salinity. These underwater hot springs are ejecting constantly mineral-rich water into the ocean, adding to its salt content. So you might be wondering, what kind of salt are we actually talking about here? Now, the term salt in this context, it just doesn't only refer to the table salt that we use to sprinkle on our food, although that is a type of salt. 
So in the ocean, we find a variety of dissolved ions that contribute to its salinity. The most abundant of these is, of course, the most familiar sodium chloride. That's table salt that you see and deal with every day, but there are many others. So if you think back to your periodic table, there is a left-hand side of the table and there's a right-hand side of the table. In general, the metals are on the left-hand side of the table, and uh, my right, your left. And the non-metals are on the right-hand side. Those would be like oxygen, chlorine, and so on. The metals are things like sodium and magnesium. Of course, the familiar ones like aluminum and copper are more in the center, but they're considered to be on the left-hand side of the table as well. So in chemistry, we say that we have a salt if we have a metal from the left-hand side of the table bonding to a non-metal on the right. So sodium is on the left, chlorine is on the right. Together, they make sodium chloride. Right? But you can have magnesium chloride. You can have you know, other chlorides as well. And in general, if it's a metal bonded to a non-metal, it's a salt. Also, sometimes metals can bond with polyatomic ions, which means ions with multiple atoms from the right. So you can have sulfate ions and things like that that contain more than one atom. But still, a salt is always a positively charged metal bonding to a negatively charged atom or a negatively charged polyatomic ion. So here's a breakdown of the major ions found in actual seawater. So of course you have your chloride ion, that's coming from the sodium chloride, that's about 55%, right? Sodium is a positive ion, that's a metal ion, 30.6%. But you have a sulfate ion, which is an SO4 negative polyatomic ion, about 7.7%. You have the magnesium ion, 3.7%. You have the calcium ion, that's a positive metal, 1.2%, uh, and you have potassium ion at about 1.1%. The remaining 0.7% is made up of various trace elements uh, existing as ions in the seawater. So are these salts volcanic in origin? Well, some of them are, but not all of them. As we mentioned a minute ago, hydrothermal vents, which are indeed volcanic in nature, they contribute to the ocean's salinity. These vents release minerals that have been dissolved from the rocks deep inside of the crust, and then of course they come up out of the crust and go into the ocean into an aqueous solution of ions. And while that does play a role, as we mentioned before, the majority of the ocean salt comes from the weathering of the rocks on the land, which isn't a volcanic process, right? So one question I had is, why don't the oceans just keep getting saltier and saltier and saltier? After all, the rivers are constantly flowing into the ocean, bringing more dissolved minerals because the water cycle is constantly raining and breaking down rocks and constantly flowing into the ocean. So why don't the oceans just keep getting saltier basically forever? Well, it turns out that there are indeed processes that remove salt from the oceans, creating sort of like a salt balance, if you will. However, these processes are generally much slower than the rate at which the salt is actually added to the ocean, which is why the oceans have indeed become saltier over billions of years. So there are many ways salt is actually removed from the ocean, and I think they're actually all pretty interesting. So we'll go through them briefly here. So if you think about the word evaporation, we have a similar word. One way in which salt is removed from the ocean is through the formation of evaporite deposits. Evaporation, evaporate. So in some shallow seas or lagoons, what happens is water can evaporate, leaving salt deposits behind. Now over a long, long time, geologic time, thousands, millions of years, these deposits can become buried, effectively removing them and removing that salt from the ocean. So you may see like a little lagoon or a, a very, very large puddle that gets sort of disconnected from the main body of water. And over a thousand years, that may evaporate and leave that salt behind. So you have a salty crust of the earth, right? And then over geological time, the upheaval of the ground may bury that and effectively remove it from the ocean. That's what we're talking about here. Another removal process, which is actually pretty interesting, occurs at what we call subduction zones. So that's where one tectonic plate on the Earth slides underneath another one. This usually happens under the ocean. So ocean settlements, including salt, can be then carried deep into the crust at these subduction zones. Now, it turns out that biological processes can also play a role in removing salt from the ocean. Some marine organisms extract calcium from the seawater to form shells and skeletons. These are the shells that you see a lot of times on animals in the ocean. Now, when these organisms actually die, their remains sink to the bottom and they become buried in the mud and the silt at the bottom, effectively removing that calcium from the water. 
Now, despite the removal processes that we just talked about, the overall trend over the Earth's history in geologic time has been a gradual increase in the ocean salinity. However, it's believed that the oceans reached a rough equilibrium in their salt content millions of years ago. Now, let's talk numbers a little bit and just speak of the general magnitude of things. Just how salty are the oceans compared to other bodies of water? So the average salinity of the world's oceans is somewhere about 35 parts per thousand. That's about three and a half percent. And what this actually means is that for every kilogram of seawater, there are about 35 grams of dissolved salts. However, this is by no means uniform across the Earth and across all oceans and seas. In fact, the saltiest bodies of water is actually the Red Sea, the saltiest large body of water, that is, with a salinity of the Red Sea somewhere around 4%. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, you have the Baltic Sea, which is a much, much lower salinity, averaging somewhere around 0.8% due to the large influx of fresh water from rivers and the limited exchange with the open ocean. Now, for comparison, let's look at some other bodies of water. The Great Salt Lake in Utah has a salinity that ranges somewhere between 5% and 27%, depending on the water levels. And then, of course, there's the famous Dead Sea that sits between Israel and Jordan, which is extremely salty with an average salinity of about 34%. Not three or four percent, 34 percent. So most freshwater lakes in comparison have a salinity of less than 0.05 percent. Now it's interesting to compare this to the human body, which has a salt concentration in the fluids of the body, such as blood and, and such, uh, somewhere around 0.9 percent. So more salty than a freshwater lake, but less than the oceans on the earth. So let's take just a second to dive into what I think is a truly fascinating question that kind of touches on some of this stuff. Did the salt in the oceans contribute to the origin of life? And is salt water actually necessary for the evolution of life in the first place? Now, I want to just say that the role of salt in the origin of life is a topic of ongoing research and debate among scientists. While we can't really say definitively that salt water was actually necessary for life to evolve, there are several reasons why many scientists actually do believe that the salty oceans were a crucial environment when life first began on this planet. Here are a few of those reasons in no particular order. The first reason is called ion concentration. So the ions that are dissolved in the salt water of the ocean can help facilitate certain chemical reactions that are important for the processes that we call life. If you look at our water, uh, that's in our body, it's somewhat salty, right? And so we can kind of see the parallel there. And basically, when you study chemistry, you figure out that most chemical reactions, certainly the ones that would need to be happening over millions and billions of years for life to develop, are probably going to be in a water-soluble environment. Water just makes it very easy for the ions and for the chemical reactions to happen. They're, they're like a canvas. You need to have a canvas to paint a painting on, right? And so a lot of scientists think that you really need a salty backdrop of water for the chemical reactions to actually be facilitated in the first place. Second reason is stability. Salt water provides a more stable environment than fresh water with less variation in temperature and chemistry. Next, we'll get to buoyancy. The density of salt water allows for easier suspension of organic molecules, potentially facilitating interactions and chemical reactions necessary for life. And finally, at the end, we have one that's really important, so don't overlook it. It's called osmotic regulation. So this is the ability to regulate salt concentrations is a fundamental feature of all living cells, suggesting that life may have evolved in this ability in a salty environment. Basically, when you study biology and you look at a cell, that cell membrane is wondrous. It allows the inside and the outside of the cell to be definitively defined, but the ions are allowed to cross, in many cases, through the cell membrane. Sometimes certain ions and sometimes other ions are necessary to cross, depending on what the cell's doing at the moment. But the idea here is that being able to regulate the salinity of an environment is something that's required for life and something that probably would have uh, evolved to happen in the ocean because the whole entire ocean is full of salt water. So that's something that probably wouldn't have happened on its own in a salt-free lake or a stream. 
However, I do want to emphasize that life doesn't necessarily require the exact salt concentration found in today's ocean. In fact, the first life forms probably evolved in water that was less salty than the ones in our current ocean. We said the salinity has been increasing over time. Remember that? So could life have originally formed in freshwater pond? Is that even possible? That's what I want to talk about next. While it's not totally impossible, many scientists consider this to be much less likely. Freshwater environments on the early Earth would have been much less common and less stable than the vast, relatively uniform oceans. The oceans also had the advantage of providing for a huge volume for chemical experiments to occur over and over again over millions of years. That being said, once life evolved the ability to regulate its internal salt concentration, it became capable of adapting to a wide range of salinities and environments. This is why we find life thriving in environments ranging from freshwater lakes today to hypersaline ponds. So there you have it. The saltiness of our oceans is the result of billions of years of Earth's geological and biological processes, from the weathering of rocks, from the acid rain falling down, to the bursting of hydrothermal vents, from the formation of these evaporate deposits, to the building of seashells. The story of our salty seas is tied to the story of our planet itself. So I'd like you to remember the next time you take a swim in the ocean or you get a taste of that salty water, I want you to remember you're sampling the result of processes that have been ongoing on our planet since the Earth was very, very young. And that salty flavor is a tale of the flowing rivers, the erupting volcanoes, the shifting continents, and perhaps even the origin of life itself. So to close it out, I'm Jason signing off. I'd like to also thank you for hanging out with me today. Please do drop me a line, leave me a comment, say hi. Let me know if you like this or not. I do read every single comment. And always remember as you swim in the ocean or walk down the street to always stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.